hello and welcome once again to the wonderful world of business law 160 now I'm going to go over chapter 22 which covers warranties and this okay so chapter 22 talks about product liability warranties and things of that sort you all have heard the term warranty before. Some of you have possibly purchased warranties on your phones, on your laptops, on your refrigerators, on your dishwashers, on your televisions. What's a warranty? A warranty is a guarantee made by a company that says if your item breaks, we will replace it or we will fix it, whatever it is. Some people, when they buy furniture, they buy a warranty on it. Now, you all know the term. You may have even exercised the use of a warranty in your lifetime. But when you break it down to the nitty-gritty, how can you prove that a warranty existed? Now, this is something I want you to know. This is going to be on your final exam. So, you have to have four things. There are four things that must be shown and demonstrated in order for a warranty to be effective. And they are as follows. The buyer, number one, write this down, number one, the buyer must prove that a warranty existed. Number one, the buyer must prove that a warranty existed. Number two, the warranty has been breached. Number two, the warranty has been breached. Number three, breach of the warranty approximately caused the loss suffered. Number three again, breach of the warranty approximately caused the loss suffered. And lastly, number four, notice of the breach of warranty was given to the seller. Again, number four, notice of the breach of warranty was given to the seller. So let's break it down. You bought that TV from Best Buy. You purchased and you paid for the extra warranty. So in case anything happens, you have that. So um, let's take a look at what the actual steps you would have to take if you wanted to enforce that warranty. Well, number one, how do you prove that a warranty existed? You show that piece of paper that shows that you had a warranty. You had a receipt. You paid for it. So therefore, the store has a copy of that, and you also have a copy of that. The warranty was breached. Well, how is the warranty breached? I bought a TV that was supposed to be working. It stopped working. Therefore, when a company is guaranteeing that an item is supposed to work or act in a certain way for a certain period of time and it fails to do so, that guarantee, that warranty has been breached. Number three, the breach of that warranty caused the loss suffered. Your TV is broken you have suffered great pain and anguish. Therefore, the breach of the warranty, because that item no longer works as it's supposed to, has caused the loss that you are now suffering. And number four, notice of that breach of the warranty was given to the seller. If you don't tell Best Buy what happens, they can't fix it. So you must give notice of the breach to the person who you sold it from, bought it from, so they can remedy the situation. Okay, so that takes care of warranties. This is a listening, not a writing, warranty of title, simply that um, it's under the UCC, it's covered under that. Um, next thing I want you to know is that there are implied warranties and there are express warranties. <clears throat> What's an express warranty? It is a warranty that is specifically written down. Um, it's black and white, it is there, it is crystal clear, there is no question as to whether or not a guarantee exists. What's an implied warranty? You've heard these terms before, by the way, express and implied, so I'm hoping these ring bells. An implied warranty is not written, but the circumstances dictate that a warranty does exist. That's a little more tougher to prove. And um, an example is a little um, 
the easiest example I could give you is anything that you buy, and let's say you bought something from a store. It's got to be reputable, not like a not like a street vendor or something. You bought a uh, a toy or a game from a toy store. You take it home, you open it up, you put the batteries in the right way, and you realize it doesn't work. Well, you expect there's no warranty specifically that you had to purchase or anything like that. It might not say on the back of it, this toy is supposed to act a certain way or perform a certain way, but when you buy something, you're expecting that it's going to work. So there might not be anything in writing, but you're, um, there's an implication that it actually is supposed to work a particular way. Fitness of, for a particular purpose. If you go to a particular store and you tell the person who works there that you're trying to buy something for a specific purpose and they sell you an item for that specific purpose it now must meet that specific criteria and it doesn't matter whether or not the seller is a merchant or not once you go and you say that I want to be able to have this product do X, Y, and Z, and it doesn't, it gives them actually, there's an extra warranty that now that's held there, an extra standard that's held there. I don't really see that legal concept in enforced too much, but just so you're aware that it's there. Next thing that I want you to know, um, oh, obstacles to warranty actions. If you do something to break the particular item that you have or you use it in a way that it's not supposed to be used then the warranty is not going to be effective you're not going to be able to get what you're supposed to get why because you did something that you weren't supposed to do privity of contract when you buy the item let's go back to the TV that you purchased from Best Buy you purchased the TV from Best Buy you have a warranty on that item take a look at that fine print that warranty is for you and your use alone. It most likely does not transfer to anybody else that bought it, so it's not transferable. So there's a privity of a contract, meaning the privity is that contractual obligation between you and the store. There are some things where the contractual obligation or that privity can pass on from one person to the next when it comes to warranties. I'll give you an example. We bought floors, wood floors, for my home, the one that you see here before you. The warranty on the wood floors was for a hundred years. And it's supposed to pass on from whoever bought it, which was us, to anybody else that has it. So they'd be able to enforce the warranty for workmanship on those floors. <clears throat> so there are some warranties that transfer ownership, and there are some that particularly belong to that one particular purpose. Um, furniture. Sometimes people buy warranties on furniture. That usually has that privity between you and that company. If you sell your furniture to somebody else, chances are that guarantee, that warranty will not be there. Why? Because what happens when you move furniture, when you sell furniture, it's going to be moved. What could happen when you move it? It could potentially break. So the company that actually put that warranty, that guarantee on it, doesn't want to have to pay anything extra if you move that piece of uh, furniture from place A to place B. Um, strict liability. Write this down. Actually, you don't have to. I'm not going to test on this. But know this. Strict liability focuses on the product itself, not the conduct of the manufacturer. So when we talk about strict liability, you're looking at the product itself, whether or not that product worked well or whether it met its purpose or whether it did not meet its purpose. Um, defective condition. What about a product that you purchased that broke, was defective, does not work? Well, it's, as long as you have not substantially changed that item, then you have that warranty. And the example I give <clears throat> This is a chainsaw example, and this was actually a case when I was in law school. This was a case I had heard in a magistrate court in New Jersey. Black & Decker was the company. So a person bought a chainsaw, a round, a circular chainsaw, and it had a safety valve on it. 
he removed the safety valve because he didn't want the circular saw to keep stopping. Now the safety valve was there for safety reasons. He removed it as he was sawing the blade went off the saw thing and it uh, cut his I think it was an aorta or something and he bled to death. There was a lawsuit obviously. And the question was, did he substantially change this particular item or was it have a did it have a defect on it? So on the box and all the safety instructions, it had the safety mechanism. Now you remove it, you have substantially changed the look of this particular item. If anything goes wrong, should you enforce a warranty? Did you expect that you were going to die, that the blade was going to fly off and kill you? I don't know. Um, so that's something that you have to kind of keep in mind. The question is whether or not the particular item is defective on its own or whether you had done a, a change to effectively modify that particular model. Um, if you had contributed to the negligence then, then that could be used to deduct any winning money that you would have gotten from a lawsuit. So let's say that Black and Decker was found guilty in for a hundred thousand dollars, but you were in fact eighty percent negligent. How much now are you going to actually be recovering? Twenty thousand dollars only. Why? Yeah, there was a defect in this particular item, but the fact that you removed a, a substantial piece of it, that safety valve, you contributed eighty percent to your that defectiveness, so you only recover $20,000. We're not in class, I'm not going to be able to answer questions, uh, but always feel free to email me if you have any questions on any of these topics. Um, design, okay, so there's two different types of defects I want you to know. Uh, manufacturing defects and design defects. So a manufacturing defect is when the product was not properly made. The product itself, there was a, something wrong when it was actually left being put together and it was not properly made. So let's say you were putting together a chair and a company was making like thousands and thousands of chairs. So they have the model of the chair that they were going to use and they have the prototype and they have the schematic and everything and they were supposed to use like six inch nails to put the legs onto the chair but instead of using six inch nails, they used three inch nails and the chairs kept falling apart. Well, that's a manufacturing defect. The wrong nail was used. Different than a design defect, where the design defect was that inherently the design itself, there was something wrong with it. So it was either poor engineering, there was poor material chosen, poor packaging. There was something with the actual design, the model of it that was wrong. So one of the examples, I don't know if this is in the book, was Ford made this car called the Pinto. The gas tank in the Pinto was placed too close to the rear axle, so the cars were blowing up because there were sparks that would fly and then the gas thing would ignite, so there would be fires there. So that's a problem with the actual design. Not good. Um, also, failure to warn. Something else I want you to know. Yeah, I'm sure you're all watching a lot of TV now because you're home. Um, okay, failure to warn. Have you seen those Tide Pod commercials? Well, when Tide Pods first came out, what did those Tide Pods look like? Anyone? Anyone at all? They look like candy. So what were kids doing with the Tide Pods? Not the teenagers that were doing that Tide Pod challenge, actual little kids, legitimate children. They were eating them because they thought they were candy. So then Tide was getting sued. So what they did was they took an active approach and they went out there and they flooded the TVs and all these commercials by saying the lid must be safely closed. These are not uh, candy. Uh, parents, you have an obligation to watch your children and make sure they're not eating the Tide Pods. You have to be aware of what's going on. Make sure that you leave the Tide Pod in a high place. 
they did all this educational campaigning to make sure that parents don't just leave these things so kids don't eat them. And um, IKEA did a similar thing. IKEA furniture, or any furniture that you build, let's say uh, kids' furniture especially, what do kids do? They climb on things. And so furniture was falling on children and killing them. So there was a whole thing that IKEA did was telling people, consumers, you must fasten the furniture to the wall, that way it would not fall. So if a kid climbs on it, it doesn't fall. Kids are rambunctious little boogers. So you have to make sure that you kind of like um, safeguard the area around them, okay? So that's failure to one. Keslo versus Bayer Corporation. I want you to know that case. Fun, fun case. Actually, some of you done, um, some of you may already know it. So Keslo uh, versus Bayer is about a case. This guy, he had these nose problems, right? So he bought this product. It was a nasal spray. And he sprayed it in his nose. And um, he actually continued spraying his nose to try to make it better for three years. And it said on the warning label, the warning label said, do not use for more than three days. He used it for three years. He destroyed his nasal passages. He had to have surgery and he sued Bayer saying that the warning wasn't clear enough. It was clear. He lost. Bayer won. Why? It clearly warned that this product should not be used for more than three days, which he did. So therefore, there was a proper warning there. He did not adhere to it. If there's any loss suffered, it's pretty much his fault. That's a fun case. I want you to know it. Um, unreasonably dangerous. What does that mean? Uh, it means a danger beyond that which was contemplated by the ordinary consumer. If you drink alcohol, let's say, you can expect that you may get tipsy, you may become uh, intoxicated or whatnot, but you don't think that if you drink a bottle of whiskey that it may have some kind of poisonous taint and that you would die, right? So it's dangerous because it's alcohol, but you may have like, you know, alcohol liver problems, but you don't expect to die out of poison or something like that because that's not what the intent of the product is. Uh, butter, right? Butter. Butter's great. Butter makes everything taste good. Too much butter can clog up your arteries and you may die from clogged arteries, heart conditions, all that stuff. But you know that butter is okay to eat in small quantities, regular quantities, but if you have too much of it, it could be a problem. But again, if you're eating butter, and it, again, laced with some kind of poison or some, I don't know, uh, viruses, the only thing I can think of now is viruses is corona, like that's what it's on everybody's mind. Um, but um, remember when lettuce used to be tainted with something? and uh, or food they would have some kind of bacteria on it so you wouldn't be able to eat it when you're eating something you could potentially be harmed from it in one respect but if there's uh, something that that's there that's not supposed to be there that's the whole unreasonably dangerous aspect um voluntary assumption of risk i'm, I'm just going over the things i really want you to know voluntary assumption of risk Again, it's when you jump off the airplane because you're doing skydiving. You volunteered for that. You decided to jump out of that airplane. You decided to do something silly. So if anything happens, that's on you. And uh, if you drive a car without brakes and you get into an accident, that's a problem. And you may think that this is a far-fetched example, but I rode in a car once with somebody who told me he likes to drive without using his brakes because it makes driving more exciting. He got into a car accident on McGonagall's Bridge. Um, yeah, so make sure that you're aware of what's happening in life and you don't voluntarily um, take on in any dangerous situation. It's not good for you. Now we talked about the subsequent alterations, design defects, things like that. Okay. That's all you need to know for chapter 
22. Now let me give you some more questions for your exam. Young people, let's see here. Okay, this one is an easy one. What is promissory example? I'm sorry, it's late. It's like 12.30 in the morning. What is promissory estoppel? What is promissory estoppel? Question number nine is what is promissory estoppel? And question 10 in the short answer segment of your exam is going to be give an example of an exclusive dealing contract. Give an example of an exclusive dealing contract. Don't forget, answer as much as you can when you're doing these exams so I can give you full credit or as much credit as possible. Question number nine again is what is promissory estoppel? Question number 10 is give an example and of an exclusive dealing contract. And that concludes chapter 22.